learn from those scenarios is that fishing requires the patience to let the person come to you. Now, that's not to say that you should never initiate an evangelistic interaction. There are times where clearly you should. But if you think about it, even if you are in the market for a product or a service, even if you're looking for a product or service, don't you prefer to be the one who initiates the conversation? If you're like me, even if you're looking for a product or service, a pushy salesman is likely to hear four words from me, and they're the same words that many people use to reject the gospel. It goes something like this. No thanks. I'm good. How many of you have said that? You've been there in that situation, and here comes that person. They're trying to put that thing in your hand, or, or the, you know, you, you answer the, you're right in the middle of some task, and you answer the phone, and it's someone trying to sell you something. I love it when they say, hey, we've reviewed your credit cards. I don't have any credit cards. You, know, you got the wrong number, right? So let's uh, see something similar in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, let's read uh, verses 10 through 13. Matthew chapter 9, let's begin reading in verse number 10. The Bible says this. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, here we have the exact same situation. We've been studying in our attempt to be good fishers of men, in our attempt to uh, do what God has called us to do and be prepared to share our faith, we are addressing some of the more common objections to Christianity. Uh, Christians like y'all are just a bunch of hypocrites. We've talked about that. Or, well, if, if there's a God, how can there be evil? We've talked about that. We'll talk about some others. Um, today, we're going to talk about the what I call the I'm good objection. Now, just like the other objections we've studied, the I'm good objection uh, can come at you in, a, in an aggressive, adversarial, uh, insulting way, or it can appear in a more innocent, uh, kind, even civil way. So let's start with the hard way. Now, before we jump into that, let's, let's remember it, what we started off with. If someone is being difficult, like these Pharisees were, and you are in this situation and you, you care about this person and you, you, you know, or maybe this person, is, you work with them and they just drive you nuts and someone throws out some difficult insult like, you know, you may have your religion, but I have my reason. I remember having a guy say that exact thing to me while I was working with him. It was like, this is going to be fun. No, but uh, we did. We had a lot of interesting conversations. But one of the things you need to remember is if someone's being difficult and aggressive and insulting, it might be best to leave them alone. That's probably not the best time to whip out your Bible and, and start in on them. Sometimes you need the patience to wait for that person to have certain experiences or to ask certain questions for them to get to the point where they're ready to receive the truth. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Or worse, you can be actually counterproductive in God's plan for that person's life. Amen? So again, if, if someone's coming at you like this, it, it may be best for you just to, to walk away. If, however... You're in a situation like Jesus was, and it's, it, the situation warrants a response. You need to be prepared to respond, right? Amen? Yes? We're all awake? Okay. So, you, we need to be ready, and you might, it, it might go something like this. How many have heard this one? Religion is the opium of the masses. Have you ever heard that before? None? Wow, I've heard this one a lot, but uh, this is something that uh, I was working with a guy, and uh, 
he, we were both security guards, okay? And both of us, it was kind of an interesting situation because I had been a pastor and now I'm working as a security guard. And uh, he had been a radio personality and now he was working as a security guard. And there were the two of us in a, you know, in a uh, post together. And he had suggested, well, you know, it's okay, Brian, you have your faith and I have my reason. And I said, are you serious? Are you really just suggesting that I'm not a reasonable person or that I don't, I don't use any sort of reason at all to form my beliefs? And he goes, well, Brian, I'm just of the opinion that religion is the opium of the masses. And how I responded to him is, is something that might be helpful to you. I said, well, who said that? Who said that religion is the opium of the masses? He said, well, I, I, uh, I said, that would be Karl Marx. Yeah, Karl Marx said that. Um, and you might find his philosophy, uh, his way of thinking, worthy of being followed. I believe that Karl Marx and this and his philosophy, including religion, is the opium of the masses, which, by the way, you're taking out of context, um, is part of a very dangerous view on how to live your life. This is kind of taking a book out of, out of what Jesus had to say here, where Jesus kind of said, he looked at these Pharisees, and if you notice in the text, he throws this out there and says, go and learn what that meaneth. You see, when this guy presented what he thought was this hardcore, sort of aggressive, insulting, uh, well, religion is the opium of the masses, I said, you know, you need to go think, learn what that really means. You might want to go away and think about where that phrase actually comes from. Read the whole statement, because even Marx wasn't saying that, that Christians are a bunch of addicted, mindless, impaired fools who are in incapable of reasoning, he was merely suggesting that religion is one way that people, groups, respond to incredible suffering like those who were, like the suffering that was taking place in uh, Eastern Europe at the time. And so, again, it's one of those things where you need to, if you have someone being aggressive and you're in a situation where you cannot get away, sometimes you need to "Quote unquote," put that person in their place. Uh, in in Book of Acts, chapter seven, we see that uh, some Pharisees were attacking the Apostle Paul, and basically they were saying, "Well, you have this Jesus character, but we have our fathers," pointing back to their rich heritage as a religious group. Paul asked them the question in, in Acts chapter seven, verse fifty-two: uh, "Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute?" He just asked them that plain question. And if they know the truth, the truth is that the Jewish people had fought God every step of the way. And that they were bragging about their fathers, and yet their fathers persecuted, even killed some of the prophets that they now venerated. Sometimes you need to let people know or challenge people to think critically about where they heard that from. Because... If they think critically, if you're, and if you're able to inspire that person to think that way, you might be able to help them. And in this particular circumstance, so here's this security guard who is clearly being insulting and aggressive toward me. And I said, oh yeah, Karl Marx said that. Really? You think that he's the guy that we should follow? So how do you think that was received by everyone in the room? Everyone in the room was basic, had basically the opinion that this mean guy who just attacked Brian just lost that interaction. And I was gracious and kind, and we had many, many conversations following that. Sometimes you're in an engagement, and you need to end it. You need to win it right there, right now. Preparing with statements like this can help you do that. Now, you might also see it, uh, see this, this hard way uh, objection come at you like this. That religion is just a virus. It's a, it's a viral addiction. It, it's something that, that you respond to and, and it just then it spreads. You know, this person responds to Christianity and next, next thing it's spreading all over the place. You might hear it say that, well, re religion is just a crutch. 
for weak-minded people, for, for people who don't understand science and for people who can't, can't cope with the reality of this cold world we live in, they need a religion. Or you're only a Christian because your parents are a Christian. Or you're only a Christian because you live in a culture uh, that is infected with this virus of Christianity. Anybody ever heard anything like this? Okay. Um, I'm going to break and, and do something different. I'm, I'm going to share a couple videos with you because you guys have to listen to me too much anyway. And so I want to share a couple videos with you that um, a guy with a cooler accent than me uh, explains these. I think the problem with saying that faith is just a crutch or a virus is that both of them start with the assumption that God doesn't exist. Now, of course, if there is no God, then both of them can provide an explanation for why people still believe. Um, you could say, well, you only believe because you want it to be true, or you only believe because that's what your parents believed, and so forth. But of course, if God does exist, both arguments can be turned in on themselves and turned the other way around. So you could say, well, the only reason you don't believe in God is that you don't want God to exist. And the only reason you don't believe in God is because you generally live in a culture where other people hold that worldview, or maybe your parents held that worldview. Now, some atheists would say, well, hang on a minute, that wouldn't happen. But actually, it does happen. Um, Thomas Nagel, professor of philosophy at New York University, said, it's not just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that he doesn't exist. I don't want God to exist. I don't want the universe to be that way. It was Fyodor Dostoevsky who said, if God doesn't exist, then anything is permissible. And so there could be an attraction, couldn't there, to say there is no God in the heavens. There is no judge ultimately one day. I can do whatever I like. So yes, faith could be a crutch for the weak, but equally, atheism could be an escape uh, from this idea of judgment or accountability. So the argument doesn't dismiss God, it just explains why people might still believe in God if God doesn't exist, but equally it could explain why people don't believe in God if God does exist. It's the same with the idea of the faith being a virus. Um, you could say, well, you're just a Christian because you live in a Christian culture. Well, well, actually, that doesn't work so much, particularly in Western society today, because the predominant mentality of Western society is one that says we're post-Christian, uh, particularly amongst the student culture in which I mix. It's much more popular and acceptable to say you're an atheist than it is to be a Bible-believing Christian. So if anyone is copying the culture around them, you could say, well, potentially it's the person who isn't a Christian rather than the person who is. So I think we need to respond to it by saying, look, these are interesting objections, but they, no, they don't disprove the existence of God, um, and they can be turned around on themselves. And indeed, many arguments that people have against God and against the Christian faith can be turned around in that way and say, hey, does this question work in the reverse direction? I think one of the other problems with saying that faith is just a virus of the mind, that it's just a meme, is that actually that idea has been quite discredited. He answers this in a different way in a different video, and I want to share this with you as well. These are all just things to lodge away in your brain or reference later. I think this is the interesting question. Um, it's easy to say faith is just a virus. You believe it because you want to believe it. It gives you comfort. It makes your life easier. It's easy to say you, know, you just believe because your parents believed you brought, were born in a Christian culture. But actually, it's not easy to say that for everyone, is it? Um, for a start, there are lots of people in the world for whom becoming a Christian and believing in Christ hasn't made their life easier. It certainly wasn't the case for the Christians uh, of the first three centuries uh, of church history who faced persecution and opposition. And it's certainly not the case for the majority of Christians in the world today. Uh, there was an article in the Independent newspaper a couple of years ago that said that Christians are the, now the most persecuted people group in the world today. 80% of all acts of uh, violence against uh, people groups are directed towards Christians. So it's just not the case that for Christians in the world today, becoming a Christian makes their life easier and they follow Jesus because it gives their life comfort. For many, it leads to opposition. 
I, I think of a friend of mine who had to flee his home and his country because becoming a Christian meant that those around him wanted to kill him. You know, the idea that Christianity was just a comfort blanket or a crutch, which doesn't really sit with the evidence of, of that kind of situation. And similarly, there are people who don't come to believe because they want to believe. In fact, they come to believe in spite of the fact they don't want to believe. C.S. Lewis is probably the most famous example of that historically. Uh, when he finally uh, came to believe in God, he writes in his semi-autobiographical book, Surprised by Joy, I was the most reluctant convert in all of England. He didn't believe because he wanted to believe, but in spite of his not wanting to believe, he came to a conviction that it was true. I was speaking to a, a girl at a university just recently, and she had many, many objections to the Christian faith. At the end of the week, she still had many objections, but she continued to meet up with a Christian friend. I heard just recently that she'd become a Christian, and she said in her own words, she said, I didn't want it to be true, but I couldn't escape the fact eventually that it was. But now I've become a Christian, I am glad that it is true. But she didn't come to that conviction because it was simply a crutch. Um, she came to it because she was convinced by the evidence that it was true. And similarly with the argument that Christianity is just a virus, something you pick up from your culture or from your family. You know, that would assume, therefore, that everyone who becomes a Christian comes from a Christian culture or comes from a Christian family. But again, think of the first Christians. No one in the first generation of the Christian faith came from a Christian family or lived in a Christian culture. In fact, culture didn't become Christian uh, until the fourth century, you might say. And similarly today, where is the Christian faith growing most rapidly? Not in Western Europe, in places that are considered kind of traditionally Christian, but in places like Iran, in places like Algeria, in places like um, Mongolia. Places that are not considered traditionally Christian, and where most of the Christians who have come to faith in Christ haven't come from a Christian family. Uh, they're not simply copying their culture, they're not simply copying their parents' belief, but they've come to an encounter with a God who is there and come to, to put their faith in him. So I think the reality of what goes on in our world today completely defeats this idea that faith is just a crutch or a virus. It just doesn't make sense when you look at the reality of what happens. Okay. So in addition to uh, my reasoning uh, for just having something different, you guys have to listen to me all the time, one of the reasons I put these videos up there and shared them with you this morning is this. If you are determined to be a fisher of men, and if you are determined to prepare your mind with answers to common objections, there are plenty of resources out there. I pulled this off of YouTube, right? There are plenty of other options and plenty of, of uh, apologetics websites and books uh, that you can follow up with, and you can keep your mind readied with some of these videos. Make sense? <coughs> And if you're committed to do so, you should have some of these out there. If you interact with a person at work and they throw out this I'm good obje objection in a very aggressive way and you don't necessarily respond too well and you know that you need to come back, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to do that, okay? So there are many, many compelling ways that you can answer people who aggressively attack your faith. We need to be, again, ready to defend those beliefs. We need to be ready to contend for the faith, the Bible says. But remember, your outcome is not to destroy this person or your relationship with them. You never want to descend into some sort of, well, you're just a filthy atheist, or you're just a dirty commie, or you're just this or that, and that's why you don't believe in God. That's not going to get you anywhere. Your objective is to address their issue in such a way that it gets them to go away and think. Like it said here, go and learn what these things mean. Isn't that what Jesus said? To get them to go away and think about, well, wait a minute, is it, is, why do I believe that? Or why did I say that? Or is that really true? And hopefully that will open up an opportunity in the future for you to have a more civil conversation with that individual. And maybe, even if that person doesn't, as has been the case multiple times in my experience, your interaction with that person in a gracious but firm way may open up an opportunity with people around, people within earshot, who say, wow, I, um, that was, I had already always believed that, but the way you answered that really made me think, and it opens up uh, these conversations, okay? So, um, now that we've kind of addressed the hard way, let's uh, discuss the I'm good objection when it shows up the nice way, right? So... 
other than a kitten or a puppy, I thought, what's nicer? A grandma, right? So this will often be a, a, a co-worker, a friend, a family member who asserts and then asks something like this. I'm a good person, right? I'm not that bad. Why would God be mad at me? Or, or I haven't done anything. You know, what, what would I have possibly done that would cause God to suggest that I deserve hell? Now, if at this point you make it your mission to convince that person that they are such a dirty, wicked, evil sinner, that they deserve hell and that's why they need Jesus, you need to understand that you, at, when you do that, you are adopting the exact same position of all the other religions in the world that tell you you have to find your, some way to earn your way into God's favor. Not only that, but you are adopting the same position as the creator of all of those religions. Think carefully about who that would be. He is referenced in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, as the accuser of the brethren. That would be the devil. So again, back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, who is the one doing the accusing? Who is the ones pointing out the sinners? It was the Pharisees, right? Did, Jesus knew who he was sitting with. But Jesus wasn't the one saying, all right, well, I'm going to come sit with you Pharisees and sinners. Right? No. It was... The Pharisee, the publicans and sinners, excuse me, it was the Pharisees, it was the religious people who were pointing out the sin. There's an example in John chapter 8, you, you might have heard the story of the woman who was taken in adultery, right? In the very act, there was no question that she was guilty. And here are these, again, Pharisees, scribes, sinners, these people were getting ready to stone her to death, and they said, all right, Jesus, what do you think about this? I love the story where Jesus just stoops down and starts writing in the ground. And when he stands up, everyone had dropped their rocks and walked away. And what did he say? He said, woman, where are those thine accusers? She said, no man accuses me. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So again, you need to be very, very careful. You need to take the time to... Carefully consider the context of the situation. You need to carefully consider the nature of your relationship with that person and where you are in your relationship with that person. And if, and only if, you feel that the, the time is right and the situation is right where, you can, where they are prepared to hear the truth in a tactful and polite way, then you proceed. And how do you proceed? What I'm about to present to you is, is, is a presentation of the gospel or a way of, of approaching the gospel that I want everyone in this room and certainly everyone that's a member of our church to get. You know, the gospel is simply the good, the good news, right? That's what it is. And I, I respond in a way that is something like this. I say that, you know, here's this person saying, Look, I'm a good person or I'm not that bad. Why would I need to be a Christian or, or why would God be mad at me? And I say, look, true Christianity, the truth of the gospel, is one of the most misunderstood truths ever. You say you're a good person, and I would agree. But are you? Am I? Is the Dalai Lama, is the Pope, the one who gets to decide what is good and not as good? Or more importantly, what is good enough and what is not good enough? The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That all have sh fallen short of the standard of perfection that God requires. So I ask this question, how much sin should be in heaven? Well, the answer is none. And so if no sin can be in heaven, that is the standard of perfection. But here's something that people need to understand. And here's what I, and I've shared this with so many people. God does not damn people to eternal punishment in hell because they just barely failed to tip the scale. You know, they were 49.8% good, and that was just not good enough to get into heaven. 
That's not reasonable. That's not loving. That's not just. That's not God. I have personally watched God forgive liars, cheaters, thieves, murderers. I have watched God take people, the, the worst, the vilest of sinners. I have watched people in jail who had molested children fall down on their knees and repent and say, I deserve death. What I did was despicable and vile. It was the result of, of this arc of pornography. And I, I became so disgusting that I was able to do that. But God would love me and forgive me and change me? God would do that? Amen. And the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. And this idea that, well, that person is so bad, God shouldn't love them. Who are you to say that? Who are you to say that, that because you've only done 10 sins and that person's done 20 sins, that you don't get to decide that and I don't get to decide that? Thankfully, God decides that. And what people need to understand, what, what you, this, this person who's saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not so bad that I, I deserve hell. What you don't understand is that God does not send people to hell for lying, cheating, stealing, killing, whatever. God sends people to hell. The only thing that God's love cannot and does not regularly overcome is one thing and one thing only. And it is the suggestion that you're good enough to do it on your own. That's the only thing God won't forgive. Because to suggest that, no thanks, Jesus, I'm good. To suggest that you in your own goodness, in your own ability can be good enough to meet the standard of perfection that is required, that is intensely arrogant. And that is to insult the cross. That is to suggest, Jesus, you didn't need to bother with dying on the cross. Thanks, but no thanks, I'm good enough. That, and that alone, is what a holy, righteous, and loving, but just God will damn a person to hell for. <coughs> to insult the blood of Jesus Christ and suggest that you and your own merit are good enough to not need Jesus, not need His Word, not need a family of faith that is in arrogance, that is pride, and that, and that alone is what deserves hell. You know, it's difficult to share this with people. It takes timing. Anybody who is serious about fishing knows that it takes patience. Amen? That it's very easy to scare the fish away. That it's very easy to say something or do something. Remember one of the first times I went fishing with Isaac. And I'm not a very good fisherman. And I was hoping that maybe we could catch a fish that it would be exciting for him and he would say, all right, we got a fish and we're doing this. And next thing I know... This brick flies in front of me and pops right in front of the water where I'd cast. <laughs> chunkin', chunkin' bricks. Well, thankfully he's learned and now he's a better fisherman than me. As Christians, we need to be careful. We need to be prayerful. We need to be constantly looking for the most effective and efficient ways to respond to people. Especially when people, the person that you're trying to share this truth with, whether they're aggressive and arrogant or whether they're honestly ignorant about the gospel truth. Isn't that a reasonable question? What have I done? Isn't that an honest question? So you don't want to be mean and, and unkind to that person. But here's something I want to make sure that you get. For you to think that you are so refined and evolved and you're such a nice person that you're just going to let them go on in their ignorance. 
Well, if that person thinks that, you know, that they're good enough, you know, and they're going to be mean to me, just let them go on. Is that what God has called us to be and do? Or, it's my granny. I'm not going to tell my granny she needs to be saved. Really? Why not? Or that person, they're, they're so nice. I'm just going to let them keep on believing that they can tip the scales. Certainly God will, will be okay with it. There was a, another video that I could have shown, something you can look up. It's, it's called the, um, the Good-O-Meter. It's a long group of people in line coming up and, and uh, you know, the clouds and the judgment. And they present this file of all their good and bad and, and they think, they seem to act as if their good should outweigh their bad, which is a myth. At the end of the line, everyone is, has balanced this out and everyone has been shuffled into that room. And another person, the last person shows up with this long list, this long file of sins and has virtually no hope. But he points to one page and he says, I've been forgiven. And Jesus shows up and says, hey, wait a minute, give me that book. And takes that one page out, forgiven hands it to them and says, you come with me. That's the truth of it. And it's counterintuitive, is it not? We as Americans, we live in this world where we think, I, I've got to earn it. My grandfather nearly went to hell because he had a mentality that says, if I can't earn it, I don't want it. And he had to come to understand that the gospel was so counterintuitive to the way that he thought about life, which that, that was why it was so difficult for him. But when he understood, and I remember him telling my dad, Jim, I get it. I understand. Stop worrying about me and eternity. I've accepted that gift. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you knew my grandfather, my grandfather used to say, I don't fear anybody enough to lie to him. My grandfather got saved because he understood the reality that we could never earn it. We could never be good enough. And that the idea that we could ever, that to even attempt to be good enough to earn heaven is an insult to the blood of Christ. Lovingly, carefully share this. If you make fishing for men a priority, that's an important question. Do you? To what extent do you make sharing the gospel with the people around you a priority? It's easy to put off to the side, isn't it? It's easy to say, well, I said it once, or I did this, or, or I'm just waiting for the right opportunity. How big a deal is it to you? Are all of your children saved? Praise God, I'm going to baptize my youngest child tonight. Are your kids saved? I know some of you pray fervently for your children. How big of a priority is that? You want them to get a good job. You want to get them a good, get, have a good education. You want them to have nice things. But how big of a priority? What is the plan? What is the best approach? How serious are you about preparing yourself? About studying, preparing, studying them, listening to what they say, listening to their objections, listening for clues as to what might be holding them back from accepting Jesus Christ so that you can go find the verses, find the, 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 the questions, maybe even go talk to the person that you think might have a better chance than you. To what extent is that a priority to you? When you make it a priority... When you make it a matter of prayer, when you make it a matter of study, when you make it a matter of conversation, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit of God loves them more than you do. And He is at work. Church, the Holy Spirit of God is at work. He loves them more than you. Jesus died on a cross to pay for their sins. You better believe you can take it to the bank that God is working in that person's life. 
He will bring people into, into that person's life. He will bring painful circumstances, challenging circumstances, positive circumstances. He will plant people all around that person in his attempt to draw them. And if you are prepared, you can get to be part of that. I mentioned my grandfather. My, you know, we, we prayed for my grandfather for years. My grandfather worked for General Electric, and he traveled a lot to set up phone stations. And one Thanksgiving, he said, Jim, you're still praying I get saved, aren't you? We all kind of chuckled and said, yeah, Grandpa, we're still praying that you get saved. He said, well, you need to stop it because I got stuck right in between two guys. So for an hour there and an hour back every day, Baptist preacher, Catholic priest. On either side of him. To and from work. And they would debate theology all day long. So I should stop that. But I guarantee you that that had something to do with him coming to the truth. Amen? Amen. I remember my other grandfather. We were sitting at lunch. I think I've told you this story before. We were sitting at lunch. And the Pope came on TV wore a special hat, held a special stick, and was speaking ex cathedra. My grandfather, who was, you know, grew up Catholic, stopped and was paying close attention and listened to every word carefully because he respected the Pope. And when he was done speaking, I said, you really believe that? I said, what do you mean? You're a Christian. I said, do you really believe what the Catholic Church teaches that when he wears a special hat and holds a special stick that he attains a position of perfection and the words that he speaks are the very words of, of God? Do you really believe that that man is sinlessly perfect? Because the Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how can that be? And he said, well, yes, yes, I do believe that. And again, my grandfather was very polite. And uh, he went out to the garage, and, and I thought he'd gone to the Elks, and I was just sitting there finishing, and he came back in about five, ten minutes later. Grandfather was an engineer, very thoughtful, and he said, say that again. And so I explained to him what speaking ex cathedra means and what that doctrine means. He didn't say anything. Until Sunday morning, when Frank Holman gave the invitation. And my grandfather got out of the aisle and he walked down that aisle and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. I didn't lead him to Christ. To be honest, I hadn't prayed as much for him. I hadn't put as much work as Frank Coleman, my dad, my grandmother. But I got to be part of it. I got to be just a small part in helping my grandfather be in heaven with us. Tell me what's better than that. Tell me what's better than that. You help someone get a good job. That'd be awesome, right? Help someone get into a good school. That'd be fantastic, right? Help, help some two, you know, a couple get together that, that match real well. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that is more eternally powerful and potent. Nothing will change your life like being part of seeing someone get saved. And if you're not experiencing that regularly in your Christian walk, it's no wonder you're struggling with joy. It's no, wondering you're, no wonder you're struggling. You start seeing people get saved. You say, God, use me to whatever extent you can. I will sharpen myself as much as possible. I will clean myself as much as possible. I will do everything I can to be ready for you to use me. You sit back and hold on because God will use you. You'll start seeing people get saved around you. Can you imagine if a church started doing that? I'm about to preach a whole other sermon. No, I should stop. I don't know about you. I want to be used of God. And I don't want there to be any weakness. I don't want there to be any, any way. When I, when I throw out a line, I want to make sure that my command of Scripture, my doctrinal command, is strong enough that if... The great white whale gets on the end of my line. I'm going to drag him in. Amen? That's what God's called us to be. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. First question is simple. 
It's obvious that none of us are perfect. But are you forgiven? If you were to die today, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? 